got two goals for starting a series on the fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> One of them is, I want you all to memorize them. I don't know how many of you in here have them memorized or not. But um, certainly if you know what they are, then you can identify the Spirit's working in your life. Amen? Amen. And then secondly, I want you to be able to <coughs> know that you bear the fruit. You don't produce the fruit. Right. You bear the fruit. Meaning, you're the one that carries the fruit. You just sort of let it hang out there on the branches. You're not the one that actually... It's the life giver to it. It's the fruit of spirit. the Spirit. Okay, so we should have the fruit of the Spirit as ornaments about us. These people should be able to look at the love, the joy, the peace, these ornaments about us hanging off our branches and be able to identify Jesus lives in that person and through that person. Amen? That's what the Christian life is. Like I said last week, it is not that we're imitating Jesus and asking ourselves, what would Jesus do in every situation? It's that we're allowing Jesus to live in us and through us. Amen? Mm -hmm. Yielding to him, allowing him to live in us and through us. Mm -hmm. If you're there in Galatians chapter 5, would you stand with me? And I'll read two verses, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. The Bible says here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Let's pray today. Father, thank you now for this time in your word, I pray that you bless our time as we speak of this first fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of love, and uh, Lord, help it to be clear and powerful. Holy Spirit, just minister to us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen, and you may be seated. <clears throat> so fruit is an outward expression of an inward Possession. Amen? Amen? So I can look at an apple hanging on a branch, and I know that's an apple tree. I can look at a pear or an orange hanging on a branch, and I can know that's an orange tree or a pear tree. And so it is with a Christian. We should have the fruit of the Spirit displayed outwardly so that other people can see that Jesus lives in that person. There's a lot of confusion about what love is in this world. And we truly need to know and identify what the love of Christ is so that we can display it on our branches, so that we can yield to the Spirit of God and be able to identify that's God trying to work in my life in a loving way. That is the fruit of the Spirit, the first fruit, the fruit of love. A bunch of young children were asked, to define love. Emily, age 8, said, Love is when you kiss all the time. Then when you get tired of kissing, you still want to be together, so you talk some more. <laughs> Karen, age 7, said, When you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down, and little stars come out of you. <laughs> Just watched a few cartoons. <laughs> Mary Ann, age six, said, Love is when your puppy licks your face, even after you've left him alone all day. <laughs> Lauren, age five, said, I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, age eight, said, You really shouldn't say, I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot. People forget. That's cute. Out of the mouths of babes and stuff. A lot of songs have been written about love. Love is probably the most written about song, or the most written about subject in songs. The Partridge family saying, I think I love you. 
Olivia Newton-John confessed, I honestly love you. The Doors just said, hello, I love you, won't you tell me your name? <laughs> Justin yeah. Bieber piped in, he always pipes in, doesn't he? with I just need somebody to love. The Beatles said, all you need is love, but you can't buy me love. Roxette claimed that it must have been love. Robert Palmer was addicted to love. Elvis sang, Love Me Tender. And Stevie Wonder just called to say, I love you. Taylor Swift, Swift, I don't even know her. Taylor Swift wrote a love story. Dolly wrote it, and Whitney sang it. I will always love you. Jefferson Airplane asked, Don't you want somebody to love? <laughs> To which Tina Turner answered, What's love got to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, then Elton John said on a Lion King DVD, Can you feel the love tonight? <clears throat> Let's look at some biblical definitions of love, would you? If you have your bulletin, look at number one there. Let me tell you today that there is, um, love is the first fruit from which all the other fruit is produced. There's no mistake that God put love as the first fruit of the Spirit. Because love is the first fruit that produces the other fruit. Now the English language is a tough one because we only have one word for love. And that is so if we want to say, I love God, we say, I love God. Yeah, we're talking English now. We'll get there in a second. We'll give you the mic. But if we say, I love church, we say, I love church. But if we say, I love hot dogs, we, we're stuck. We, we only have one word in the English language in which to convey through speech that we love something. Now, the Greek language has four words. It has eros, storge, or storge, phileo, and Miss Carol? Agape. 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 Amen? <laughs> the first word that we'll look at today is the word eros. That is a passionate type of love. This is a romantic type of love. It's this love uh, in first sight you know, falling in love. It's all based on a physical attraction to somebody else. Doesn't really get any deeper than that. We'll see if that key continues on. You know, it might be my phone. My pocket. Um, heard about a man. He was. He loved his girlfriend. He wanted her to marry him. So he said, "I love you so much." He said, "I want you to marry me." He said, "I know I don't have a new car like Johnny Green." And I know I don't have a new house like Johnny Green. And I know I don't have a good job like Johnny Green. I know I don't have really nice clothes like Johnny Green, but I love you. And his girlfriend said, well, I love you too, but tell me more about Johnny Green. <laughs> <laughs> That's Eros love. That's just a physical attraction. It's just sort of skin deep. It doesn't go beyond that. Then there's the store type of love. And this is the family attraction. This is, uh, you have a blood that flows thicker than water. It's a natural affection, the type of love that a parent has for its child, or the type of love that a child has for its parent. It's the type of love that you and I would say, I love America. We just feel like we belong. There's a, a natural affection for it. It's what causes us to go to the family events, even when we don't necessarily know or like everybody that's there, but we're compelled to go there because of the storm type of love. The third love is the flail love. All right, when you think of Philadelphia, what's it known as? The city of brotherly love. It comes from two compound words. It comes from phileo, 
and Adelphos. And Adelphos means brother. All right, so it's the city of brotherly love. This is the type of love when you say to your buddy, hey, I love you, man. It's a friendship type of love. It's the type of love where if I had an ice cream cone, I would give you half. If I had six candies, I'd give you three. If I had two apples, I'd give you one. If I won the lottery, I'd send you a postcard from Tahiti. <laughs> and it's, it's not real sacrificing. It's not real giving. It's a friendly type of love. Can any of you guess what the fruit of the Spirit is? Agape. It's the fourth type. The fourth type of love, the agape love, the sacrificial love. It's uh, in, in, found in John 15, 13, where it says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Amen? Amen. Sacrificial love. I'm willing to give everything type of love. C.S. Lewis wrote a book on the four loves. And he said the four loves just sort of seem to interconnect and they're hard to differentiate between sometimes. But he said those first three loves, Eros, Storg, and uh, Phileo, they are need loves. In other words, I need to be loved in the Eros way. I need to be loved in the Storg way. I need to be loved in the Phileo way. But the agape love is a gift love. It's the love that's meant to be given. It's the love that God gave and we truly understood for the first time in John 3, 16, the way God loved when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's that agape, sacrificial type of love. That's the type of love that God wants us to have display out on our branches. It's the first fruit of the Spirit, and without <coughs> developing this fruit or yielding to the Spirit of God, you can't really produce the other fruit because all of it hinges on you understanding how much God loves you and how much God loves. In fact, the King James translators were looking for a word in the English language that would get across this idea that for God so loved. That when they wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the, the best word they could think to describe love was the word charity. That's agape love. That's giving type of love. Not just I need to be loved this way, but I need to give with this type of love. William Barclay, a great theologian, said... Agape is a feeling of the mind as much as it is of the heart. It concerns the will as much as the emotions. It describes the delib deliberate effort which we can make only with the power of God. Never to seek anything but the best, even for those that seek the worst for us. Turn with me, if you would, in Colossians chapter 3. Agape love is the most important fruit. Without it, you can't produce the others. You can't have the others. <clears throat> the same writer that penned Galatians is the same writer that penned Colossians. Paul, the Apostle Paul. And he switches metaphors from fruit in Galatians to clothing in Colossians. And he says that we actually have to adorn this fruit or these pieces of clothing. He says in Colossians 3, 12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Look down at verse 14. And above all these things, put on... Charity. Charity. That word behind that's a God. Put on this agape love. Above all these other things, 
put on a gop a love, like a piece of clothing, like an ornament hanging out on your branch. This is the bond of perfectness. So this is the glue that is going to help you mature. This is the first fruit that's going to allow you to bear all this other fruit. I heard of a teenager that had an old fruit tree next to his bedroom window. And at night when everybody else was sleeping, he would lift up his window and he'd climb out across the threshold onto that fruit tree. And he'd climb down that fruit tree and he'd run out and play with his friends for, uh, during the wee hours of the morning. <coughs> One morning at breakfast, his father said, I'm going to cut down that old fruit tree out in front of your, your, in front of your bedroom. He said, it just hasn't produced any fruit in years. And the young man thought, boy, I've got to do something. That's my escape route, amen? These boys don't get any ideas. <clears throat> and so what did he do? But he, he went out to his friend. He told his friend, my dad's going to cut down that tree. You've got to do something. So they went down to the, the market, and they bought a bushel of apples. And they came back, and they tied the apple to the end of each branch of that tree. And uh, Daddy came home that night, and he said, Daddy, look, it's a miracle. The fruit tree is bearing fruit. Look at all these apples. And his dad just looked up and went, wow, that is a miracle. That's a pear tree. <laughs> and you can't artificially produce fruit either. You can't just put on the agape love. You've got to get to the point in your Christianity where you, you're understanding that Jesus is trying to love through you. He is wanting to produce the fruit, and you're the one that's supposed to be bearing it. You need to yield and allow Him to do it through you. Why? Because fruit is an outward expression of an inner nature of Jesus living in you. Now, you can never love like God loves until you first realize how much God loves you. That's where it starts, amen? amen. Look with me in 1 John 3, 1. You may know in your head that God loves you, but how much do you really know it in your heart? 1 John 3, 1. The Bible says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Amen. Just, I'm in awe. I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. What manner of love is that? That somebody as wicked and as vile and as, and as transgressed as much as you and I have, has spit at Christ and rejected Christ and turned from Christ, what manner of love would, would bridge that gap and still allow us to be called? Try and get your mind around that. And it sort of reminds me of this lady that grew up in great poverty and didn't see much of anything growing up. I mean, they had very little money, very little food, very little possessions, uh, had no heat, had no air conditioning, She's had a very small home. She lived through the Depression in the plains of America. Didn't see much of anything growing up. And she got to her old age and she knew, uh, her family knew that it was always a dream of hers to go out to the Pacific Ocean and just see the ocean. It was something we had to take for granted. So her family bundled her up and made a three-day journey from the plains of America over to the Pacific Ocean and they set her up on the edge of a cliff and she just sat there and looked out at the Pacific Ocean and tears started welling up in her eyes and rolling down her cheeks and said mama what's wrong mama are you just are you upset that it took this long to be able to see the ocean she said no I'm just really happy to see something God made a lot of <laughs> Because I've only had a very little amount of everything my whole life. And look at all that God made in this ocean. I mean, have you ever looked at the ocean and just thought to yourself, wow. Have you ever looked up at the stars at night and just thought to yourself, wow. My God made that. 
And look out at the seashore and think of every little grain of sand that makes all that up and realize that God loves you more than there is sand on the seashore and more than there is stars in the sky and more than there is water in the ocean. God loves you so much. He gave His only begotten Son. He agape loved you. He sacrificed Himself for you and for me. That's what Ephesians is trying to get across in Ephesians 3, 18 and 19, where it says that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. You got a hymn book? Turn with me if you would. To page 29. We sing, Jesus loves me. We sing, love lifted me. Those are a couple great songs. This one's hard to sing. But wow, the words. It's in verse 1 here. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Yeah. The guilty pair bound down with care, God gave his only son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Now before we read verse 3, this was written by Frederick Lehman. He was a Nazarite preacher. He based verse 3 on a 1,000 year old Jewish poem. Okay. Back when it would have been written then, it would have been written with ink and a quill. Okay. Verse 3. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? So basically that just means if we filled in all the oceans with all the ink, trillions and trillions of gallons of them, and we made all the sky, even the whole universe, from horizon to horizon, one big parchment. And then we made every tree out there a pencil so that somebody could dip it in ink. And we gave 7 billion people in the world a pencil to write the love of God, it says here, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean what? Dry. Dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. How much does God love you? How much does God love me? Even the skies couldn't contain uh, the parchment and the oceans couldn't contain the ink if it was dipped with a quill and written up there. For God so loves you Amen. that he gave his only God and Son. God agape loves you. God sacrificed for you. And you say, I'm just not sure I can love somebody. No, my friend. The first fruit of the Spirit is that agape love. The evidence that you're a Christian is that you're willing to love others in some degree or some form of fashion to the degree that God loves us. In fact, number three, the only way you can love anyone is to let Jesus love them through you. The only way you can love anyone is to let Jesus love them through you. I heard of an old pastor that got up and he preached on a Sunday on love. It's a hard subject, by the way. The next day, he was getting concrete poured out in his backyard for a new patio. He went inside for a moment, came back outside, and he saw a bunch of the neighborhood kids taking sticks and writing their names in the concrete and sticking their hands in the concrete so they could leave their handprints there. And boy, he got down there and just started yelling at them, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here! And scared them off. Went back inside of the house to call the concrete contractor back and his wife said, boy, you 
preached on love yesterday. <laughs> that wasn't a very loving way of dealing with those kids. And what the wife just knows, doesn't she? And uh, it's hard being a pastor and trying to live all that. Have you ever tried living all the things that I preach up here? And, uh, <clears throat> and so he said, no, you don't understand. I love people in the abstract, not in the concrete. <laughs> you see, I love people like it's some sort of idea. Like, like it's some sort of, it's a hard thing. Like it's some sort of pie in the sky idea that I love people the way Jesus loved people. But for it to be a concrete reality in my life, look with me in 1 John chapter 4. It's not just an idea, folks. It's a command. To gift this love to people. To love folks the way Jesus loves you. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Look, look down at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. See, it's the fruit. It's the evidence that you're a Christian. And His love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. Amen. And the fruit of the spirit, first of all, and primarily the first fruits of it is agape love. It's the evidence that Jesus loves you. What is love? The unconditional love. Commitment to an imperfect person. You say, when I love you at the altar, you're, you're supposed to say this is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person? That's how God loves. Amen? An unconditional commitment to you and to me, imperfect people. Some of us look around and we think, boy, that person's just unlovable. That's not true. God loves everybody. Amen? Everybody is lovable because God loves them. Now, they might be unlovely, and that's often the case. And they act unlovely. But God's love is a love where it's an unconditional commitment to imperfect people. And you can only love that way if you let Jesus love others through you. Now, you ready for a test? Envision the person in your mind right now that you have the hardest time loving. Picture that person in your mind right now where when you see them coming towards you, you think, oh, here we go. Don't be thinking of me. Look at me that way. <laughs> you got that person in your mind? What? Yes, yes. yes no, no. <laughs> Envision them. Now ask yourself. Do you really believe Jesus loves that person? Do you really believe Jesus loves that person? Now, would you let Jesus love them through you? See, you're his feet. You're his hands. You're his touch. You're his eyes. You're his ears. You're his heartbeat on this, on this earth. Jesus wants to love them through you. So he gave you his spirit and he said the first evidence that you're my child is that you will love others the way I would love. 
the night before the crucifixion, there's a Passover myth. And none of the disciples would do the lowliest servant's job, which was wash everybody's feet. So Jesus did. To show them that he loved them. And he cared about them. And as he went through every single disciple's feet, washing their smelly, grungy, grimy feet, he got to a man named Judas Iscariot. And he already knew that Judas had sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. And he already knew that the feet that he was washing were going to be the feet that led the angry mob to him when he got betrayed with a kiss. But he washed his feet anyway. And I don't think he gave them the express clean either. I think he did a thorough job. I think he got between the toenails real well and cleaned between the toes and washed his feet the way God loves somebody. Don't you think if Jesus could do that to Judas, knowing what was going to happen the next day, that he could love that person through you? All we have to do is what? Yield. Surrender. And allow the Spirit of God to produce the fruit that we bear out on our branches. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Who knows what 1 Corinthians 13 is called? The love chapter. It's a great chapter to read before you weddings. Amen? Understanding the commitment. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I'm becoming as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I give the gift of though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains. Wow, that would be pretty cool. And have not charity, I am what? Nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned and have not charity. charity. You can say agape too, by the way. Or say love, by the way. This, that's the agape giving type love. Though I have not, it profiteth me nothing. Verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not be, behave itself unseemly, speaketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child and I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. The greatest of the fruit of the Spirit. The first fruit of the Spirit is God's love. And we can only ever love anyone as we allow Jesus to love them through us with God's love. There's a pastor out in Washington State. He paraphrased 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. And I want to read it for you. I changed it a little bit. 
If I speak with the confidence of Donald Trump and sing with the ease of Celine Dion, but don't have love, my words are like scraping fingernails on a blackboard. If I can hack into the CIA's mainframe computer and outsmart my chemistry professor, if I can memorize the Psalms and read Leviticus without dozing, but have not love, my value is equal to a pile of used dental floss. No. If I give my designer clothes to goodwill and let my little sister rummage through my closet, or if I donate a gallon of blood every hour but don't have love, my offerings are useless. Love is patient, even if it means skipping a trip to the yogurt shop in order to tutor an immigrant. Love is kind. It doesn't stoop to ethnic jokes. Love does not envy the basketball team captain, the national merit finalist, or even the blonde who sports the most even tan. Love doesn't get a swelled head over straight A's or a scholarship to Yale. Love isn't snooty about a new car or season tickets to the Cowboys. Love never laughs at the fat kid who hangs out of his t-shirt and phys ed. Love smiles when getting off, cut off in the interstate. Love submits an honest tax return. Love doesn't whine about the referee's bad call. Love hangs onto the hope when your family is coming apart. Love does not change like hemlines and hairdos. Love is like the Energizer Bunny. It just keeps going and going and going. In the end, only three things will remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. This week, you're going to be confronted with unlovely people. Are you going to let God love them through you? You can't do it in your own strength. Instead, you're going to have to whisper a prayer. God, I know you died for them. And I know you love them. And Lord, I don't have the strength to love them, but I sure want you to love them through me. Why? Because fruit is the outward expression of the inward possession of Jesus living in you. Amen. My friend, you're not, you're not a very good Christian if you can't let God love through you. That's where it starts. This is what you have to start working on. You've got to start looking past the way people dress and start looking past the way people, uh, the color of their skin and the way they act and the way they talk and the way they smell and start getting a passion for their soul the way Jesus did. Why don't we all stand today? Heads bowed and eyes closed. You're struggling with that one that you just don't think you can love. Well, you're right about that part. You, you don't have what it takes in you to love. But why don't you come and bend your knee at an old-fashioned altar and ask God to help you love them by loving them through you. By loving them through you. Page 301 in our hymn book. You can sing if you want to. You can come and bend your knee. And ask God to do a mighty miracle. As the fruit of the Spirit is evidenced on your branches.